Good morning, everybody. Jim Kelly here, speaking to you from Renaissance Christian Church in Vancouver, British Columbia. Well, actually, speaking to you from my living room because our church building is closed at the present time due to the COVID-19 situation. We will be restarting soon, but not until it is absolutely considered to be as safe as possible, perhaps in another few weeks. In the meanwhile, I want to share a few words this morning about the mystery of the church. There are some secrets that God hid from everybody in the past, which are revealed in the New Testament. When you see the word mystery in the Bible, it is something that was not, that was made, well, that was unknown in the Old Testament, or at least maybe just partially known, but it is now fully exposed in the New Testament. The mystery in the New Testament began with the revelation of God incarnate, the story of God becoming man, of God in human flesh. But that's only part of the story. Colossians chapter 1 from the Voice Bible says, I am a servant appointed by God to preach the word of God until it is known to you and all over. What I'm talking about is nothing less than the mystery of the ages. What was hidden for ages, generations and generations, is now being revealed to his holy ones. He decided to make known to them his blessing to the nations. The glorious riches of this mystery is the indwelling of the anointed in you. The glorious riches of this mystery is the indwelling of the anointed in you, the very hope of glory. In the Old Testament, the Jews knew that Messiah was coming. They expected him. But what they never really understood was the Messiah would not only come in, in a very human body, that he would then live in the bodies of the people that followed him. What they didn't know is that your body and my body would become the temple of the living God. That was the mystery. And yet that is the mystery that we have to announce to the world, that every person has a place of glory or honor, both now and a hope of future glory with God, by virtue of the fact that Christ is in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We of all people on this globe are uniquely and absolutely blessed because God is in us. What a thought. This is the distinctiveness of Christianity. It is what separates Christianity apart from every other religious concept in the world. It is all of him in all of us. Many Christians today ask, well, how can I obtain faith? Or how can I really know God? But sadly, they don't seek God himself for the answer. Instead, they rush off to seminars that claim to teach believers how to increase their faith. Or they buy books like Faith for Dummies that offer quick steps, the one, two, threes on how to increase your faith. Or they travel hundreds of miles to listen to lectures on faith by prominent evangelistic speakers and teachers. We are greatly if we think of relationship with Christ as some lofty level of mysterious feelings-based communion with the divine, as if it involved some secret knowledge of God that goes beyond what scripture has revealed. That idea is the very heart of the Gnostic heresy. It has nothing to do with true Christianity. If somebody tells you that they know something that is not revealed in Scripture. They don't know what they're talking about. Run from them, my friend. Run from them. In the Old Testament, God was out there. When Jesus walked the earth, he was Emmanuel, Christ with us. Now comes the mystery of the ages. God is in you, the hope of glory. God in you the hope of glory. Authentic Christianity is a mystery to many people because Christ is a mystery. Because of our intimate personal relationship with him, Christians are a mystery to the world. Those who do not know the Lord Jesus will not and cannot be expected to understand the true Christian until they too have a personal knowledge of him. A.W. Tozer 
got to the heart of mystery when he wrote in The Roots of Righteousness that Christians are crazy. How'd you like that statement? Christians are crazy. A real Christian is an odd number anyway. He feels supreme love for one he has never seen, talks familiarly every day to someone he cannot see, expects to go to heaven on the virtue of another, empties himself in order to be full, admits he is wrong so he can be declared right, goes down in order to get up, is strong when he is the weakest, richest when he was the poorest, and happiest when he feels worst. He dies so he can live, forsakes in order to have, gives away so he can keep, sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, and knows that which passes knowledge. God is not far off. He's not a long distance away like the gods of the pagans. God is here, living in us. And I'll tell you something, friend. God would not go to this great effort of justifying us if he was just going to leave us alone. Rather, having been gun in the spirit, we are being perfected in the spirit. Having begun with the power of God, we are being sustained by the power of God. Having been justified by the power of God, we are being sanctified by the power of God. And he lives in us. Now I use words sometimes that you may not understand. I'll just explain one of them right now, and that is sanctified. Sanctification is a process of change. It's as we are being made from glory to glory, as we are being improved in our lives. Excuse the telephone, I'm not answering it right now. Christ lives in us. And that is why these processes in our lives cannot be halted. Sin in our lives may slow the process, but God will still affect the progressive work through blessing or chastening. I like what Spurgeon said, tiny foxes spoil the vineyards and little sins do mischief to the tender heart. Do you ever get exasperated by your failures? Do you ever get to the place where you find tears in your eyes because you're sick and tired of the same failures? You're sick and tired of battling the same things in the same front? That, my friend, is conscience. It is a holy discontent that God is producing in you. That's why God gave us conscience. It's part of our DNA. We all have conscience. Yes, some people can sear their conscience. They burn it by just choosing to do so. But most of us, all of us, still have conscience. Did you know that God does not like careless living? He wants us to live responsibly, and that means maturity in our living. It means controlling our tongues and our actions. It means caring for people even when we don't feel like it. It means paying our bills and our debts. It means not complaining when we don't get our way. It means loving others when we don't feel like it. In other words, God wants you to hate sin, and sin is defined as missing the mark. To aiming at the target with your dart and missing the mark. Sin is as simple as that. It's missing the mark. Now, God also produces in us a holy aspiration as he's working on our will. That's the flip side. A longing for something better. A longing for something pure. A longing for something holy. A longing for something righteous. A longing for something true. A longing to be like Christ, a longing to be godly, a longing to be honorable, a longing to be victorious. Holy discontent, holy aspiration, and holy resolve. That's where commitment produces holy work. And that's what God is doing in you. He's working on your will and he's working on your work so that you will do what is right. What a great promise. God is at work in us. You've probably heard the, or read the slogan, please be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. 
There's a great truth in that saying because the underlying message is that God is at work in us. In Philippians chapter 2, we see an essential factor in understanding the word working in us. We see his person as God, his power, and that he is energizing our spiritual development. We go from his power to his presence, for it is God who is at work in you. What a great statement. God is at work in you. God in you, the hope of glory. He's not working on you. He's not working for you. He is working in you. He is energizing you. What a profound reality. In Ephesians 3.20, Paul says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to his, the power that works in what? Us. The power that works in us. God can accomplish and does accomplish through you that which is unimaginable, unthinkable, beyond your ability to plan or reason or dream. He is affecting the sanctification process. Now, there are different points along the journey of life in which we find ourselves. And we don't usually know the reasons for some of the convoluted trips that many of us are taking in the process. But nonetheless, as God affects sanctification in each life, there's a pattern of progress by which God is working to please himself. And he is the power behind it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you remember Luke Chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus looked at that motley bunch of weak faith in disciples and said, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Isn't that an astounding statement? Most of us would have probably said, well, we're really upset with you, but we're going to condescend and maybe we'll give in and we'll give you the kingdom anyways. Well, that's not how it came down. He said, it's your father's good pleasure give you the kingdom. So in spite of your lack of faith, in spite of your lack of discipline, it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's a God of love. He's a God of compassion. He's God of grace and mercy, and you are very dear to him. And when you will and work what he wants, he is pleased. Now, isn't that the essence of relationship? to give to one another so that there's pleasure. He wants your best because when you do your best, that pleases him most. He takes pleasure in you. He takes pleasure in me. And what he wants is to produce in us our very best for his pleasure, for his satisfaction. Now, isn't it great to think that I can possibly bring satisfaction to the very heart of God? Think about it. James Patrick Kelly, you could will something, you can do something, you can have potential to bring, to be a person that brings satisfaction to the heart of God. Unbelievable, isn't it? I certainly can't do that in the flesh, but God can work in me to will and to work that which is his great pleasure. So wonderful thing about being in a relationship is bringing pleasure to the other person. What good is a relationship if all it does is bring you pain and grief and sorrow? Who needs it? What everyone wants out of a relationship is satisfaction and pleasure. What we want out of a friendship is, is satisfaction. We want joy in the other person. It's not about what they do for us. It's not about what we do for them. It's just taking joy and pleasure in who they are. That's what a relationship is all about. And God says, you can bring him that. God is dwelling in you. He's always present, always supporting, always sustaining, always upholding, always supplying, always strengthening, always shielding, never out of his care, always producing sanctification in your life. He is and will continue to affect change in our lives. But did you know this? 
He can do it at his speed or he can do it at our speed. That choice is up to us. It all depends on us. God is in us and he knows us and he desires the very best for us. He's a God of love, a God of compassion, a God of grace and mercy, and you are very dear to him. But will you let him work in you? He believes in you. As we close, let me ask you a question, a real personal one. Only you can answer it. God is at work in you right now. So what would he like changed? Have you ever thought about it? What does he want you to will? What does he want you to do? What habit might he want you to change? What relationship does he want you to make right? What relationship does he want you to break? What relationship does he want you to build? What attitude does he want you to change? What desire does he want you to ignore? What ministry does he want you to do? In what area does he want you to be faithful? What wrong does he want you to make right? Know that God is working in you to cause you to will and to work that which pleases him. Your speed or his speed, that choice is yours. Christ in you, the hope of glory, that's the mystery of the church. It's the mystery of the New Testament. Now, the Christian church often seems anemic and listless. Individual Christians often seem lost and floundering. But if people will commit themselves to him, there is hope. If we are willing and receptive, God will break into our church, into our families, into our nations with his light, and there is no limit to what can happen. Do you want change? Do you want to see God moving in our world today? It's up to us. Ask him. The Bible says, ask not, or you have not because you ask not, I mean. You have not because you ask not. Are we asking, friends? If we want to experience revival, and revival just means new life, new life, it must start in our own lives, but it won't happen if we go on living the same old, same old. I conclude with a quote from Pastor Rick, also from Renaissance Church, from a prior message, and he said, what we do now determines what God does next. What we do now determines what God does next. Thank you for listening to these few words today. I hope they've been a blessing to you, and I hope you'll come back next Sunday. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and Pentecost Sunday is the birthday of the church. So I'm going to talk about the church next Sunday, and I hope you'll join me. God bless you, keep you safe, and give you a wonderful week. Bye for now.